Hello. We're live. Hi, Facebook. <laughs> Hello. How are you? Uh, I'm Michelle Gislison, and I'm here with the lovely, wonderful Aspen Baker. And we're turning the tables a little bit because normally, Aspen, you are the interviewer, and today you are the interviewee. Uh, a little as, weird. A little weird, perhaps, <laughs> yeah. Um, and you are transitioning out of your founder, executive director role at Exhale after 15, 17 years. We'll talk about that. Um, so I'm really just delighted to be with you and to have a conversation because that's what this is going to be as a conversation. Uh, first, I want us to locate ourselves because we actually scrambled a little bit this morning getting over here. And so we, I want to just say like where we are physically. We are in the central building in beautiful downtown Oakland. And um, we have a room full of people that are behind the scenes that you can't see. So I also want to like name the people who are in the room. Mara and Nina and Amalia and Kimball are all here in the room with us. Um, and I want to bring someone else in the room, which is Rich Snowden. Yeah. Because I want to talk about how we first met. Yeah. So uh, more than 10 years ago, I was um, on staff at Compass Point, and Rich Snowden and I were co-facilitating Thriving as an executive director. And in walks Aspen Baker as one of the executive directors in that series. And it kind of felt like, to me, it felt like a little bit of a sign. And I'm going to say what I mean by that. Um, so I believe in signs. My partner Keenan does not believe in signs, Keenan. Um, but there are a couple signs for me. So one is when I first met you, I was actually reading about leadership and nature and living organisms. And I was reading something by Margaret Wheatley, and it was about aspen trees. And uh, she was sharing that aspen trees, while they are they they're everywhere, and there are thousands of them. And if you go to Utah, there's like thousands of acres of aspen trees everywhere. If you look below the surface, it's one interconnected, inter interdependent system, right? Um, it's one living organism. And I was like, that is so effing cool, right? Um, and then the other thing that happened is that, and you know this, I, I don't know if you and I have really talked about it since then, but um, my grandmother passed away. Mm -hmm. And I was at her memorial service with my entire family, and, uh, and my grandmother was very Catholic and she insisted on a Catholic memorial service. And so the whole family, despite all of our religious differences, were sitting in this big church at her memorial, and her priest, just unprovoked, started talking about abortion. And it was this very polarizing moment for our family. And um, it was really disheartening you know, that that was happening in that moment. And I remember talking to you, and we had just met, and I was sharing this experience with you. And um, you were sharing your experience and you were sharing um, your stance as a leader about the full humanity and the um, listening, just deeply listening to people despite where they might be. And I just found that so powerful and um, very much needed in that moment. And so for me, I was like, here are these signs. <laughs> and here's Aspen Baker, right? And I just, uh, it felt like we were meant to meet you know, at that moment. And so I'm just super, super grateful for that. Um, so first I just wanna appreciate you for that because it was just this really, this very special connection and moment. Um, and then I'm thinking about this moment in time, this socio-political moment that we're in. Um, I do want, I feel like I, I need to mention and wanna acknowledge um, Hurricane Harvey, mm -hmm. which is in this moment displacing more than I think 30,000 people. Um, and in these moments of extreme weather, ex uh, extreme disasters, it's communities of color and people of color who are impacted the most. Um, so I do uh, wanna share, and you and I talked about this, um, that um, there's lots of hashtags going around social media right now. One of them, Alicia Garza has shared, and I'm grateful for that, which is a just Harvey recovery. Um, so hashtag, check that out. Um, it's a way to get resources to people who are on the ground um, and the communities that need it most and just sending a lot of love to Texas right now. Um, and it made me think about extreme storms mm -hmm. and um, it made me think about polarizing, right? Because um, I, for myself, I feel like at no other moment in time have I felt such extreme polarization. Um, and such political discord, and so much of either or, this or that, um, us and them, and it's just really deep and really profound, and here's Aspen Baker. <laughs> um, and 
to me, everything that Exhale is about and everything that Pro Voice is about is about really transcending that polarization. So I'm going to read a passage, and then I'm going to ask you questions, All right. okay? Mm -hmm. And that's from, surprise, surprise, from Pro Voice. Um, and this is a passage that really stood out to me, which is, 10 years later, in the middle of winter in New York City, three young women stood in front of a room of complete strangers, a classroom of college students, and shared their layered, complicated, personal truths about abortion. Not a single one of their stories fit easily into a box marks, marked pro-choice or pro-life. In fact, one of them told how it was these very boxes that had caused her so much distress after her abortion. She couldn't make her feelings fit a political agenda. And I just was like, wow, you know, that, that sentence in particular, she couldn't make her feelings fit a political agenda, was really powerful. And I feel like in this moment, it's so live for me. And so I know that Exhale and Pro Voice is all about profound listening and about storytelling. And so I'm just going to ask you questions um, and maybe go back a little bit to thriving as an executive director. So this is a curiosity interview. Yep. You might see me writing some note cards. We do this in thriving as an executive director of uh, listening for values or qualities or things. So you might see me doing that. And those cards are for you at the end. But, um, I want to just go back and think about the story of Exhale and Pro Voice. And so, once upon a time. Once upon a time. What happened? <laughs> what happened? Um, well, I think, you know, once upon a time I was a nice Christian girl. <laughs> yeah. um, and I was raised to believe that abortion was wrong, and I thought that I would never ever have one. Um, <clears throat> And so getting pregnant, making the decision to have an abortion, and then you know, starting to put, pay attention to the way abortion was talked about for the first time, especially as someone who, who has had one, um, just started a lot of things. And uh, you know, I just graduated from college. I was getting a degree in peace and conflict studies, so I'd been looking you know, at conflicts around the world and how different communities had organized to make change. Mm -hmm. And so I had this kind of like theoretical, like peace theory, <laughs> peace and justice theory, and then I had this like real life domestic cultural conflict. And I was like, hmm, you know, can we apply this? Can this, can this work for this issue? Um, you know, and that's like the heady thing. And then there's like the real life thing uh, there was no one to talk to um, and I wanted to talk to someone and I imagine that other people wanted to talk to and I think so much of you know what's happened over the last 17 years um, is kind of like holding so many things at the same time like trying to hold you know that there's just real actual people that have real actual experiences that need to be able to talk about them and need to be able to get support and then understanding the context that those experiences are happening, and then understanding the strategies that would take to change the context, and then trying to talk to people <laughs> about all of right. those things. You know, it's a lot of conversation. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah. 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 And so, um, what do you feel like you learned in all of that as you stepped into this formal executive director position, founder of Exhale? I know like now looking back, it's like, it feel, you know, like it's like this plan. Like I was planning to be like a founder executive director and start an organization and you know, that there was not that plan. There was, you know, there was a need. And then, um, you know, I spent some time trying to understand that need and, and going around talking to people in different organizations, learning about organizations. I didn't come from a you know, I didn't know anyone that had worked in nonprofit organizations. So I kind of I learned everything from from scratch, and I read a lot of books, and um, and then you know when once we kind of had this group of co-founders, you know, I make the joke that the reason I became the executive director was like I showed up with the agenda at the first meeting, <laughs> and I remember like asking like, can I write the agenda? Like, is that presumptuous for me to write the agenda? Is that okay? You know, like. Just kind of, I do start kind of sorting those things out of how things happen and how you move an idea. And so they were like, yeah, have an agenda. And it's like, oh, you know, little <laughs> did I know that's what was going to make me the executive director. And I think, um, 
you know, I, I've always had this title, uh, but the job has changed a lot, and I don't think I really, you know, sort of earned the title. Like initially, you know, it was like there was one job I wasn't paid. It was the executive director, and I think I sort of grew into that role and grew into that title um, over time. Okay. And you know, when I think of my side of the story of us meeting, mm -hmm. that's probably you know, which was about 10 years ago, yeah. it's like at this time where I feel like I actually was an executive director. Like I knew what the job was, mm -hmm. I knew what I was supposed to do, I knew what other executive directors did, you know, sort of like what best practice was. And, um, and I remember like the years leading up to that being like, well, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> this is really hard. Yeah. Uh, what's gonna make it easier? Yeah. And I thought that if I learned all of these skills, you know, if I learned how to write a budget and write a grant and do a strategic plan and build a board, you know, like if I learned all these skills, that the job of executive director would get easier. Yeah. And if I um, had more money, the job would get easier. And if I had more people, like more staff, the job would get easier. So I was like, kind of like kept waiting, like all of these things. Yeah. And then I got all those things. Right. I could like do it in my sleep. I could right. write a strategic plan in my sleep. We have more people and more money. And then it was just more, yeah. you know, it was more complicated. And I, and I was pretty burned out. And I remember um, Evelyn Shen um, saying, you know, me kind of sharing with her how I was feeling. She's like, you need to go take this class at Compass Point called Thriving as an Executive Director. And in my mind, I was like, whatever. <laughs> like, nothing's, nothing's gonna help. And I had had, you know, leadership development opportunities um, over the years because I was a young woman leader. Yeah. But um, it, nothing had ever, so I was very, like, skeptical. And then it was $400, which was a lot of money for Exhale at the time and a lot of money to, for me to say to the board, like, I deserve this and I want right. this. But because it was Evelyn and I trust her, I was like, fine. Thank you, Evelyn. <laughs> We're bringing Evelyn into the room too. <laughs> I will. I will take that class, and um, and everything. And my life changed, and my leadership changed because of you and Rich and. Um, and the other people that were in the room that I continued to have relationships with and the shift of perspective from that like deficit mindset of like when I have more things will be better mm -hmm. to the idea of like you have everything that you need mm -hmm. and like the mindset shift and the um, you know just the like paradigm ethos kind of shift of being a leader and I changed. Wow. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I mean well it's be that's beautiful and wonderful and I want to ask about like if you could go back to that moment in time when you were just getting started, when you were like, how to's, how to's, yeah. you know, all this stuff. Like, what would you want to say to that aspen? It's hard, you know. At one sense, it'd be like, oh, I wish it was easier, you know. Yeah. Um, but at the other, the other side of it is like, it was like my process, and so I kind of I. I I feel like compassion for her yeah. <laughs> and I remember uh, you know how difficult it was and I you know in some ways I wish it could be easier but in other ways you know it, it did um, you know for lack of a better like toughen me up like I did you know it was a process that I kind of had to go through I think yeah. so um, you know I, I think that I would say like it's gonna work out yeah. Like it's gonna work out. Like you're 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 doing the right things that are gonna take you in the right places, and you're gonna make a lot of mistakes, and you're gonna get tired, and you're gonna get burned out, and you're gonna you know you're gonna find people like Michelle, you're gonna find people like Rich. There are people that are gonna really help you along the way. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that leads me to another question, yeah. and I'm gonna kind of bounce around in the questions yeah. a little bit, but um, there's something about making the invisible visible mm -hmm. in your journey and in all of this work. And so one question is, who else do you want to bring into this room? Like who walked with you on this journey that you really want to honor? Yeah. Um, the first person that I want to say is my husband, Chris. Um, you know, when we, <laughs> Chris Strasser. Uh, 
you know, when we met, I, my the abortion had already happened. You know, I'd already, you know, broken up with the guy. It was like a few months later, and like our first date. And he's like, "Tell me about what you want to do in life." And I was like, "I think I'm going to do this thing around abortion." Like that was like <laughs> date one. He was like, "That's hot." <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> we'll have to ask him, but he was definitely like, I, like supportive, you know, and interested and like, what does that mean? And curious and not, I'm not like scared away. And so, you know, that was, you know, 17 years ago of, of founding the organization, of having the idea of moving it forward. Um, we've basically, you know, been in relationship for 17 years. We weren't obviously married at the time and are married now. Yeah. And, um, you know, he, I think there has been so much um, change and challenge and opportunity, you know, in the job. And he's just kind of been with me and supporting me, you know, all along the way. So that feels really important. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so a few people, like, there's tons of people. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> there's tons of people. And a couple people, you know, come to mind. And one of the things that, um, I'm actually like really proud of that I don't really ever get asked about you know um, is that like exhale hasn't missed a payroll in 15 years oh, wow. um, and I feel really proud of that uh, for a lot of different reasons um, you know like there's never been like a furlough or like we can't pay you and so the other person that has helped me with that is Pat Foley oh. and she's our bookkeeper Yay. <laughs> Hi, Pat. <laughs> and Pat has been with Exhale for almost 15 years and like her and I would just like sit and look at that computer together you know and I remember times when it's like there's like $50 in the checking account and everyone still gets paid you know because I had another board member you know Kathy Schreiber who was just like go get a line of credit you know go get a credit card <laughs> like these are they're just cycles you know like we don't have to freak out you know every time there's like a cash flow crunch you know we can still pay people we can still grow and so just that sense of like it is true abundance like thinking and that like long term thinking that there's always been these board members um, and others, you know, that really helping me make these decisions for Exhale for the long term. And, yeah. um, you know, Kathy Schreiber is one of those people. Um, Julie Davidson is one of those people. Yeah. Sabrina Hersey Issa is one of those people. And those two are in my mind um, because, you know, one of the like invisible, visible things, yeah. um, you know, it's like how we, like how we make decisions about how we spend our time and who we spend our time with. And, you know, in the nonprofit sector, we're just, it's a tough place to be for a lot of different reasons. And one of the reasons that makes it tough is kind of the culture of like deficit thinking and just like settling for less all the time. We'll just like take what you can get and the sort of older like charity mindset that sort of comes in. And, you know, I, I think, you know, different Julie and Sabrina at different stages of the organization, you know, being like, um, you know, hey, that donor kind of like treated us shitty, you know, and so like, are we going to go back and ask? And, you know, and I remember like Julie really helping me think like, we're going to leave that $20,000 actually on the table and we're going to walk away because what we would rather do is find the right donor for us. Yeah. And so rather than like trying to like make ourselves like fit to this donor who's like treated us like crap, we're going to go find our donor. Yeah. And we're gonna go spend the time and and when you don't have that much money and you really need twenty thousand dollars <laughs> that is a very very difficult like decision to make um, and it's also very empowering yeah. and I think you know most recently our other you know board member Sabrina Hersey Issa you know is just like don't settle Baker you know like, yeah. <laughs> and I think having the you know it's one thing to kind of see that and know that and then in the moment those decisions we are just like oh my gosh you know what is like you know, it's what's the harder thing in the moment, but what's going to take us to where we need to go later. And sometimes those decisions feel like they're in conflict with each other. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I hear a few things um, when I'm hearing your story. One of them is that 
I hear gutsy like all over the place, right? Not just you, but like who you surrounded yeah. yourself with, right? Absolutely. Like all the hearing like all these gutsy women, all these gutsy people. That's right. So making really hard, difficult choices in the moment. So I hear that gutsiness. Yeah. Um, I also hear that you surrounded yourself with support, right? So that's the thing. Like here's one of the myths, right? Of uh, of leadership is that it's solo, that it's heroic. Like that's such an like old, outdated model, right? It's, it's painful. Like, it's super painful, <laughs> and it doesn't work. Like no. that's the thing. Like it's a total setup, yeah. right? And so that you didn't do the, you didn't make those choices alone. You were like sitting down with people and in conversation and in community with people. And um, I love that you claim that. You know yeah. that you're just like I. You hear all the people, right? Yeah. Um, and that just the trans I wrote like challenges scarcity right so like transcending that scarcity and that deficit mentality which we're so steeped in in the nonprofit sector you know so I really it's appreciate like, that you know it's like a big it's yeah I don't know that I, I think I say this word wrong all the time but it's like insidious insidi what, insidious what insidious insidious yeah. <laughs> yeah. so it just sort of like creeps up and you don't even really know that it's like happening right. yeah. um, in the moment and I remember you know like rich being like it's okay you know, you can like slide back into deficit thinking for <laughs> like a minute, you know, but then you, but then you fix it and then yeah. you like go back and sort of like I am right now. It's like, well, I haven't been to the gym in a few months, but I'm going to go and then I'm just <laughs> going to keep going, you know? Yeah. So it's like being aware, having compassion for ourselves that like we just, I can't be on it all the time. I can't always be making an abundance-based decision with a thriving mindset <laughs> in an empowering situation when yeah. it feels like the world is sort of crashing down or um, and things are urgent or there is crisis. Um, but I think what we have tried to do and what I learned, you know, what we've learned from you in particular and some of the work that we've done together, you know, is really like naming and striving for a culture so that um, we can rely on the culture of abundance and the culture of being strength space in the organization. Um, and so how we how we talk about it and then how we practice it and and you know it's one thing to be like let's write all of our values on our website <laughs> right and then we just kind of do what we always do yeah. Yeah. and then and then ha having a group of people that can say are we living our values is this a values based decision is this a strengths based decision I don't think it you know I don't think it is I think this would be and kind of like the rigor of that um, and and having people that can be you know in that rigor and 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 that's how the culture um, can get created yeah well in that rigor and also again I want to go back to the gutsy piece because um, you know exhale as an organization and you as a leader are in this really unique position because you you are it's the gray area right like you've lived in this gray area of we're not pro-life, we're not pro-choice, we're pro-voice. Mm -hmm. And there's this like, you know, we're both in and out of like reproductive health, reproductive rights. Um, so I'm curious about when you say like values and strengths mm -hmm. and like making really hard choices mm -hmm. and like really living into those, like say more about like what that experience has been like for you when you're confronted with a lot of people who are like, t take a stand, yeah. right? So how, how has that been for you? Um, I think initially it was devastatingly hard <laughs> uh, and I laugh because what else can you do <laughs> right. um, but initially um, it, it's interesting because in one way we were nobody we were just like five people we had like a thousand dollars and some cell phones and an idea you know, so like, do we have power? Do we have money? And we didn't feel like we did, but it turns out we actually did. And so that was really interesting because then people sort of see it and be like, well, you have to be for, you know, you have to be for us or against us. And I didn't understand, I didn't understand that as much as I do now um, from, you know, the experience of people, especially who've been working to support abortion access um, for so long what it feels like to be so targeted what it feels like to be so attacked um, for so long um, I don't think I had as much you know compassion or understanding of that initially because I was coming from the place as like I'm your patient like I'm your client like why is there like not a place for me and why isn't there you know not a place for other folks and so it like it was very 
real in a very personal way like initially but then once an organization gets built and once you're starting to like say what your mission is and once you're starting to say what your values are um you know people you know this is where the money comes from you know you want to get a grant it's gonna you know come from you you know taking a particular stance um, so then that becomes like, are we funding driven or are we mission driven? Yeah. And I think initially I said, well, you know, I wasn't planning on this being like my job or career. I, I said, well, if I'm going to do something then I want to do something that might possibly sketch out a different path. Mm -hmm. And if it's just like something I do as a volunteer and if there's only ever five of us or there's only ever 10 of us then we can at least try to hold a different kind of ground. Yeah. And we can try to gain some experience on what it's like to hold a different kind of ground mm -hmm. in the midst of this conflict. Like that is also part of what we're doing. Yeah. And, and, and then over time, um, and you know, and there was a lot of like, that's too complicated, people aren't gonna understand it. Um, you know, you don't, be, don't isolate yourself, don't be alone. But what we found was that there was also people attracted to that. And that had felt left out for you know a variety of reasons, and so then the more that I stayed in that place, mm -hmm. then I gained what I think of as like the muscle memory of it, you know, because all my analogies are about sports and <laughs> athletics. <laughs> so I started to gain the sort of like yeah. muscle memory. I didn't have to think about it as much anymore over time, um, sort of living in that gray area, and I could see how the gray area. You know, grew and 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 how it overlapped with all sides, and how it influenced all sides, and I could see, you know, the sort of the social impact of it over time as well. And so then I would gain more confidence because I was like, oh, this person five years ago used to like yell at me at conferences, and now the same person is standing up saying like, I think we should listen non-judgmentally to women. And I'm like, that is an excellent idea. <laughs> I'm so glad you said that. Amazing <laughs> how so, that happened. <laughs> and so, you know, like my how I what I have seen social how social change get made or how and social change in, in people's thinking and in their hearts and in their minds, it's very complicated. Yeah. Um and and it so yeah, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Well, I mean, there's, God, that I, there's, I wish we could be here for a very long time because there's so much to unpack in that, but um, I mean, there's something about engaging hearts and minds. There's something about you just like your core when you talk, I'm like, your core is strong, right? Like you are standing in a place of like, I'm clear about my values, our values, I'm clear about you know, our purpose and I'm standing in that even with all of this stuff coming at me, coming at us. and. Um, that's a really hard thing to do, you know, and so I just want to, you know, lift that up as well. And I'm curious about, um, because I just got the signal that we just have a few minutes left. I can't believe it. Um, like, who are you, who are you becoming now? Like all this learning, this whole journey that you've been on for the last 17 plus years, like, who are you becoming now? <laughs> I want to be like super awesome. Yes, honestly, of I don't course. Know. Um, uh, it's so it you know I in this moment I don't feel like I actually have that much perspective, frankly, and um, I'm looking forward to having some perspective. Yeah. And I have a number of friends and colleagues that are founders and that you know founded organizations out of personal experience at young ages. You know, it's a particular kind of being a founder, um, you know, who have left their organizations, you know, over the few years um, before me. And so I've gotten a lot of their wisdom and advice and experience. And they've just kind of been like, you really have to close the door in order to like open this next door because we've spent our whole lives, basically, like our whole adult lives to this point, yeah. sort of thinking, living and being the, the leader, the spokesperson, the you know, the manager, the crisis community, you know, like all of the things <laughs> and like it's been our whole lives and I, and I have loved that, yeah. you know, I have loved having meaning and purpose and sometimes I'm just like, how did this get to be my job? How did I get to be so lucky yeah. that this was my, this is my job and I've gotten paid for this. 
you know, and then I think about it and I'm like, oh yeah, that's how it happened. <laughs> it's not, you know, it is a combination of so many different things, but it does, it has been a real honor and a real privilege. And I think, you know, probably, you know, the mission is, is my mission. It's my mission in life. Um, and I, it will, you know, um, manifest in different ways outside of this particular role. Um, and outside of this particular title. And that feels really good. And it feels really good. Yeah. What do you wish that I would ask you right now that I haven't asked you? Um, you know, I, you know, part, part of being executive director and a leader is like, I just mentioned like these three names and there's these other three names that I didn't mention. <laughs> and what I, you know, what I just hope uh, comes across and that people feel because that after 17 years, you know, there's co-founders, there's board members, there's staff, there's volunteers, there's alumni, there's former donors, there's fellows, the, the people that you were talking about in, in the book that have shared their stories and, um, you know, like so many people have like, you know, come through Exhale and, and, and made it a true community organization. And I'm so grateful for everybody that's had a role and whether they were, you know, took one call on a talk line, on the talk line, or they took 500 calls, you know. Um, everyone's had a role at, and, and brought the organization to this point. And, um, you know, I know that a lot of people get really nervous when founders leave organizations and, and but I can tell you that inside the organization, um, people aren't nervous, you know. Uh, this is an organization that's really rooted in its culture and in its mission and um, everyone's really excited and, and ready to go and you're going to be hearing, you know, more about the, you know, the next leader and what Exhale is doing and I just feel really um, excited to kind of like now be a, a part of the exhale community in a, in a different kind of way. So um, I'm just really grateful. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. Well, and I, it's not surprising that, so here's this moment where you created this thing. You created this beautiful, amazing thing and you didn't do it alone yeah. and you and others have you know, been on this journey together and I'm looking at this beautiful slide behind you and there's like all these faces and beautiful smiles and so just really honoring and bringing into the room this collective, right? So you pivot into something new. Yeah. Exhale and Pro Voice are in the world that's right. and they're not going anywhere, right? And um, that's a really powerful thing. And in this moment, again, in this socio-political moment in time, for me, what mm -hmm. I need as a leader is I need more of this. I need more of the Pro Voice spirit and the guts um, and the community and so I want to th say thank you because I've gotten a lot from this too and I know that there's a lot of people out there in Facebook land that are saying thank you too so thank you, these flowers have been soaking up all the goodness Aww. and all the wisdom and those are for you and thank you. I just have so much love thank you. for you and thank you for inviting me you're the best, Michelle Gisselson. You're the best, Aspen Baker. <laughs> Mutual Admiration Society, everybody. All right, thank you so much.